for the public-private relationship offshore developers, which resulted in, among other things, 40 units of affordable housing uh, in the north end of the city of Burlington. Uh, that the city, through a CEDAW office, should receive this award does not come to me as a great surprise, because I think that anybody who would look at the work that CEDAW has done in the last three or four years in terms of housing, in terms of women's rights, uh, in terms of economic development, uh, would understand that there are very few offices of their kind in the United States that have been as aggressive and as successful as CEDAW has been. Clearly, the issue of affordable housing is to us a major concern in this area. And one of the goals of this administration from many years ago has been to sit down with private developers and to say, as they go about their business, developing what they had agreed to develop, what can you do in the area of affordable housing? And clearly, the agreement that was struck with North Shore said that as you build your housing in the North End, we also would appreciate from you some affordable housing. And as many will recall, the original uh, agreement struck between the city and North Shore called for many of those units, or almost all of them, to go into the land trust itself. And it turned out for a variety of reasons that did not take place, but not because of North Shore's lack of commitment in that respect. But the end result is that we have 40 units of affordable housing uh, at Howe Meadows that we certainly would not have had uh, if there had not been the cooperation between the city and the developer. And I think all of us understand that as the federal government continues to cut back in providing funding for affordable housing, as the state does not accept its responsibility, clearly there's going to have to be continued efforts between local government and private developers in a wide range of areas to make certain that we have uh, affordable housing. And I want to thank North Shore for their willingness to live up to their end of the bargain and uh, to, in fact, make a very generous commitment. Um, let me give the mic over to David. David, thank, thank you, you for Mayor. coming to Burlington. Thank you for having me on such a delightful day. When I left Manchester, it was a rainy, lousy day. I get up to Vermont, it was beautiful. We always have sunshine here. <laughs> uh, as the mayor has said, I'm here representing the Department of Housing and Urban Development and Secretary Samuel Pierce to present to the community and to the developers and the nonprofit groups who got together in a spirit of entrepreneurship and a public-private partnership to provide for affordable housing, provide access to lakefront for the citizens of Burlington, and at the same time make development pro possible for the developer in a, in a, what is a tight housing market in the Burlington area. Uh, this certificate of national merit, which the department is presenting, is one of seven being given to communities throughout New England. In northern New England, the area that I represent, there are only two such awards being given this year, this being one of them. Um, there were 89 of these nationally of 438 that were nominated and several uh, hundred more than that that were originally submitted. So it is a rather unique award and it really recognizes the achievement, the leadership, the energy that the city uh, has devoted to working with private enterprise in the community to really make for a better community. And uh, I think the result of this project, particularly the affordable housing aspect, and the uh, access to the lakefront, and the fact that not only was the public side represented, but the private side was represented through the uh, North Shore Partnership and through three nonprofit organizations, uh, who I should mention, uh, the Burlington Youth Employment Program, the Habitat for Humanity, and uh, the third group, which was the uh, Burlington Vocational Education Program, are also involved in this negotiation. Um, along with the city and the North Shore uh, developers. So I have this Certificate of National Merit signed by the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, Samuel Pierce, uh, which I will present to the mayor, and we also have copies for all of the other participants in the program. Thank you very Thank much. You. John or Rod, would you like to say a few words? Who's, who's speaking today? Rod, Rod's going to speak. Rod's there. Want each of you as well. So thank you very much. Sam. We're making you famous celebrities here. The other day you were on television. <laughs> yes, yes, you are. Yeah. Why don't you just, let me slip a little bit? Well, this is uh, certainly unexpected for us. We didn't know anything about this until a couple of days ago. It's very rewarding, and. Uh, we hope that uh, it can be the beginning for our company of uh, similar ventures in uh, this city and, and in others. Uh, we share the, the mayor's uh, feeling that uh, 
the production of affordable housing is becoming just ever so much more challenging uh, as the years go by. So we're happy to have been able to make this a part of this project, and uh, we, we thank you for, for this award. John, I'm sure you might have something to say as well. I think you've, uh, you've said it quite well. What do you say to someone who says that? I think that the answer to that question has to be uh, a lot of the scale. Uh, uh, the, the village of North Shore is perhaps certainly the largest project that's ever taken place in the last number of years, with the exception of one that I can think of, and that one's really not very far along yet. Uh, uh, it, it has to do with the fact that when you get a, uh, a large scale project going, it's, it's much easier to to produce some uh, uh, some uh, some affordable housing as part of that large-scale project. Uh, in this particular case, there were a number of things that went together. We happened to own a piece of land that was available, where uh, a lot of land is not available in this city, um, and so a lot of things fell our way. Uh, it's not an easy thing to do. I hope that this isn't a one-of-a-kind situation, but um, uh, uh, but I can understand very much when. Uh, how how uh, much less flexibility uh, other developers might have in, in in trying to produce affordable housing when they're in the midst of a much smaller scale project or a uh, much more limited site. I think one of the interesting aspects of, of this project is that uh, some of you will recall a few years ago the city administration proposed the adoption of inclusionary zoning. And what inclusionary zoning would have done is that it would have required that for all market rate developments of housing, that there be a segment of that housing, either on-site or off-site, that was affordable to persons of low and moderate incomes. Unfortunately, today in the city of Burlington, we do not have inclusionary zoning. I would like to see this sort of uh, relationship where all developments brings forth a mixture of housing available to people of all economic backgrounds, the rule rather than the exception. But I think one of the remarkable aspects of this award is that in spite of the absence of an ordinance requiring developers to produce affordable housing, through negotiations we were able to achieve this relationship that uh, did in fact accomplish that objective. Do you have any more in the pipeline? I mean, you had something they wanted too, though. You had a couple of prime well, acres on... That, that is true. And I, the city will continue to do everything within our means to achieve low and moderate income housing. And if there are developers out there that have something that we need, be it land or be it below market financing, then we will use whatever leverage we have to bring about affordable housing. And I will also suggest that this is not the end of the debate, that the Board of Aldermen, within the next couple of weeks, will be receiving a rate, uh, will be reviewing and acting on a very ambitious range of affordable housing initiatives, which do in fact include inclusionary zoning. So the discussions as to how the public sector can work in cooperation with the private sector to produce affordable housing, those discussions will, will continue. And there'll be discussions not limited to what can happen within the city of Burlington, but will also involve what are, in fact, the regional responsibilities in this area. How many that, that were selected? There have been 89 projects in Washington. So 89 projects? Yes, all of various types of projects, many of them which had participation, had financing. This one had no public subsidy at all involved in it. One of the very unique things about it. Uh -huh. Also, the use of the Burlington Lane Trust, which is sort of a model that I believe other communities are interested in and have been to Bur Burlington to uh, study it. Nationwide? Nationally. And seven in New England. Seven in New England. And cities will submit their projects for consideration. Is that how it works, or do you go out yourself? Well, and usually we try to. The projects that we know that have been successful, for instance, this one we have no direct participation in, but we, we did know of the project, so we encourage the city to apply. The cities may apply in the wrong. Inclusionary zoning, 
developers don't like that at all. I feel like it's the city holding, um, sort of, sort of forcing them to do something which may not necessarily be economically viable for them. And they, developers have said in the argument last time that, well, if you do put inclusionary zoning into effect, it will drive developers out of the city. Rod, what do you think about that? I think that uh, there was a guy who served on the mayor's uh, affordable housing task force that's sitting on my right that probably could address that much more uh, articulately than I could. Well, on a national scale, uh, inclusionary zoning is a pretty much a norm in a lot of major cities. Um, it is a nemesis to a lot of people in the development community. Uh, projects, as Rod said earlier, have a scale, and depending upon the scale, inclusionary zoning can be a, a reality which makes sense for a community in a socially responsible way. Um, if somebody's coming in and putting up a 20-story office tower and uh, daycare is needed, uh, there's been often cases where linkages occurred in places like San Francisco for that kind of thing. So impact on a community is important and also the tax revenues and achieving a balance on those are important. So across the board, if you said, do I like it? The answer is it depends on the project, the scale, and whether or not it can work. If somebody's out building six units of housing, it obviously doesn't make any sense. But on a, on a large scale, it, it's a good give and take procedure and it's, community, it's responsible, that's all. And I think that if balanced with proper incentives, it can be a situation where we'll hold out the carrot and they'll want to eat it. Do uh, projects like this leave a good profit margin for the developers, or do you do this on a goodwill the, uh, basis? The projects that are involved in the affordable housing are either, um, in this particular case, were either not for profit or uh, record, or uh, in our case, uh, caused a bit of a loss. Um, the intention was uh, a break-even um, or slightly positive cash flow to offset some of the expenses uh, that took place in the front end of the project. Um, we, uh, unfortunately, from an issue of timing, we lost our qualification for UDAC grant uh, when we started the project because of Burlington's low unemployment, and therefore the infrastructure of the project had to be paid for entirely with private funds. We ran into a few political problems along the way. Yes, as well. <laughs> How's the North Shore itself doing? The village of North Shore, is, if that was your friend, did, did very well. So it was a good, again, that's, that represents the trade. It worked well. How do you spell your name? L-A-F-O-N-G. That was the hard question. I'm using the rest of them. Anybody else? Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. You may know how to read, but is it enjoyable? Have you had the pleasure of opening a good book, keeping up with your local affairs, sharing what you've learned with your friends or with your children? If you're missing out, you don't have to. Learn to read for enjoyment. Find out what's going on and make up your own mind. Join the A-Team for New Readers at the Fletcher Free Library. Call 863-8307 today. Read and take off. The issue that we're going to discuss today is certainly one of the most important issues facing the people of the city of Burlington, and in fact, uh, the people of the state of Vermont. And it deals with a fair method for funding education. Let me begin by making a few simple points about which there should not be uh, major disagreements uh, within our state. The state of Vermont must guarantee that every child in Vermont no matter where he or she lives and regardless of the income of that child's family, the state of Vermont must guarantee that that child receives a quality education and the opportunity to advance his or her intellectual capabilities to the greatest degree possible. In my view, there is no more important function that a civilized society undertakes than the education of its young people. The debate that we have been having in the state for the last several years and a debate that will be, in fact, the most important issue that the Vermont State Legislature will deal with this year is a simple one. Number one, how much money should the state appropriate into state aid for education? 
Number two, how do we raise that money in a fair and equitable manner which asks those people and institutions who can best afford to pay higher taxes for education to pay their fair share while leaving alone those low and moderate income people who simply cannot afford higher and higher taxes. How do you raise the money that you need for education in a fair way? Three, how do we best distribute the state aid to education to make certain that those communities who are in need of additional funding actually receive the help that they need? How do you get that money out to those communities who most need it? Those are, in fact, the major issues uh, that the legislature is going to have to tackle in terms of state aid to education. Last month, the Board of Aldermen of the City of Burlington and I were in unanimous agreement that the so-called foundation proposal being supported by Governor Cunin was a very incorrect and unfair approach toward dealing with the crisis of educational funding in Vermont. In my view, the foundation proposal moves in exactly the wrong direction because it will make Vermont even more dependent upon the regressive and unfair property tax than we are today. And today we are one of the states in the union that is most dependent upon the, this absurd way, the property tax, this absurd way of funding education and municipal services. The foundation proposal is not a progressive or fair proposal because under it, working people, elderly people, and poor people who own homes in so-called property-rich towns will be asked to pay higher and higher property taxes to go into the state aid to education coffers. Conversely, under the foundation plan, there will be millionaires in the state of Vermont who happen not to live in the so-called property-rich towns who will see no increases in their taxes for educational funding. In fact, in some instances, they may actually see a decline in their taxes as a result of the foundation proposal. Rather arbitrarily, therefore, and as a function of geography, poor people's taxes will go up if they have the misfortune to live in town X, while a millionaire will see no increase in his taxes if he happens to live in town Y. This is a highly irrational methodology on which to base revenue collection, in my opinion. We should ask individuals to pay taxes based on their ability to pay, not on which town they happen to reside in. Secondly, and equally absurd, the distribution aspect of the foundation proposal once again ignores the income of the residents of a town and their ability to pay and distributes state aid to education solely, solely, once again, on the property wealth of the town. That is why, under the foundation proposal, a town like Shelburne, which has one of the highest median adjusted gross incomes in the state of Vermont, would receive a $600,000 increase in state aid to education, which amounts to an almost 200% increase over what that town is getting through the Morse Giuliani formula, while Burlington, with the lowest median adjusted gross income in Chittenden County, would see no increase in state aid to education, and that's at best. At worst, we would see a statewide property tax come in here, raise people's property taxes, the center to Shelburne and other communities. If the foundation plan is grossly unfair, what in fact is a sensible solution to the crisis in educational funding in Vermont? A solution that would ask those individuals and institutions who could afford to pay higher taxes to pay their fair share while leaving alone the vast majority of our citizens who simply cannot afford higher and higher taxes. Also, what type of proposal would distribute state aid in an equitable manner? In other words, it's one thing to criticize the proposal, it is another thing to come up with a more sensible proposal that does what has to be done, and that is to provide quality education in a fair manner for all the kids in the state of Vermont. For a start, the state government itself cannot run away from its responsibility for raising the additional revenue that we need. Governor Cunin has proposed a $3 million increase in state aid to education this year. Given the educational needs of our state, this is an insignificant 
sum of money. Last year, for example, the governor increased state aid to education by $9 million over the previous year, which at least was beginning to accept the state's full responsibility. This year, we're talking about a $3 million increase in state aid to education. In my view, I would concur with the Vermont League of Cities and Towns that a $22.8 million increase in state aid to education funding would be an appropriate amount if we are serious about providing real help to the school children of our state. Where do we get that money, and what is the fairest and most equitable approach toward raising close to $23 million? Number one, actual growth this year in existing state taxes now going in to the state aid to education program would equal $5.3 million. Obviously, all of this money could go into the state aid to education. This requires no tax increase at all, but just natural growth in the state, and that $5.3 million immediately should be targeted to the state aid to education program. Number two, during the last five years under President Reagan, the wealthiest people in the state of Vermont have been paying significantly less in personal and corporate income taxes as a result of a variety of tax breaks for the wealthy established in Washington. As Vermont's personal and corporate tax system is coupled to the federal system, these same individuals have, over the last five years, been paying less in state personal and corporate income taxes, which is why we recently had a deficit and why we today are inadequately funding education. To my mind, the fairest way to raise the desperately needed revenue that we need to adequately fund education is through an increase in the personal and corporate income tax which would ask those individuals and institutions who can best afford to pay, who have been paying less in the last five years than they previously did, to start paying their fair share. A 7% increase in the Vermont personal income tax for those individuals in our state earning $60,000 a year or more on just that part of their income over $60,000 would raise approximately $9 million. That means nobody who is earning less than $60,000 a year would be asked to pay anything more in state income taxes, and those people earning $60,000 or more would have to pay 7% more, not on the first $60,000, but only on that income above $60,000. These individuals would now be paying 33% of their federal tax liability to the state of Vermont, rather than 26% for their income over $60,000. I should point out here that the wealthiest individual in the state of Vermont would still, under this proposal, be paying far less in state and federal income taxes than he or she paid six years ago. Number three, a slight increase in the corporate income tax in the state of Vermont would bring in approximately $3 million in new revenue. In my view, this is an appropriate approach because corporate tax rates have also declined in the last five years under President Reagan. Lastly, I would propose a state tax on vacation homes of non-residents of Vermont. This tax would be an add-on to the local tax rate and would make the total tax rate on these vacation homes equal to 80% of the average tax rate in Vermont. This tax would bring in approximately $5 million. To conclude, if we are serious about increasing state aid to education, so that all of our children receive a quality education. And if we believe that this money should be raised from those who can best afford to pay, we can go a long way toward improving the current situation without forcing low and moderate income Vermonters to pay one cent more in taxes than they are presently paying. This approach to me is a far superior approach than that offered by the foundation proposal. Thank you very much. Have you got a name for this? Do you have a copy of it? Yeah. Okay, one of the You got a name for the Changes, Leopold proposal. The, uh, well, we'll give it a name right now. We'll call it the Fair Tax Proposal. For education. For education. Once again, I, the point, main point that I want to make is that what we're talking about is really not very complicated. If one agrees, as I do, not everybody does, but as I do, that you need to significantly increase state aid to education, then what the real debate about is, where do you get the money? What is the fairest way of bringing in the money? And then, in fact, what is the fairest way of distributing the money? There are many valid... Any formula, that is sunsetting this year. 
The governor's proposal essentially would raise the additional money that we need by raising property taxes in, in my view, arbitrarily selected quote-unquote wealthy towns. And within those quote-unquote wealthy towns, you're going to have many low-income people, working people, and elderly people who by no stretch of the imagination are wealthy. They are going to have to pay significantly higher property taxes. In the next town, you could well have a millionaire who, because he doesn't live in a so-called wealthy town, will be asked to contribute nothing more to state aid to education. Furthermore, in terms of the distribution approach, foundation is wrong on both ways, in terms of raising revenue and in terms of distributing revenue. Once again, a city like Burlington, which has the lowest growth per capita income in Chittenden County, would at best gain nothing. At worst, we'd have to pay higher taxes. Shelburne, which is generally considered and statistically understood to be one of the wealthiest communities in the state of Vermont in terms of the income of its residents, would receive an additional $600,000 in state aid to education. It does not make sense. And uh, my hope is that uh, with this proposal and with other proposals in Montpelier, we're going to have some very serious discussions about how to raise revenue and distribute state aid on a progressive manner.